Hi, I'm Susan Sample, the writer in residence at Huntsman Cancer Institute, and I'd like to invite you today to take a moment to reflect. One of America's most beloved poets, also long celebrated in the world of medicine and literature, is Lucille Clifton, or perhaps I should say was. Clifton died 10 years ago at the age of 73. Yet for me, as well as so many others who are fortunate enough to meet her and see her, she continues to live on. I was thinking about her this morning after reading a message that came out from the leaders of the Huntsman Cancer Institute. They issued a statement on racism and discrimination. The primary focus and central focus of our hospital, they wrote, is to provide exceptional care for people with cancer. We can only do this when each of us feels safe and respected. Lucille Clifton was a cancer patient. She was treated for three different kinds of cancer, as well as being treated for other health problems. She, um, one of the procedures was a kidney transplant. Her writing teaches us how to respect the person as well as the body, especially black bodies. As one critic writes, Clifton's poems are committed to truth telling in the face of historic silence. At the same time, she invites us to celebrate. The best way, of course, to understand Clifton's poetry is to actually listen to it and read it. So I'd like to share some selections from her work. She wrote 11 books of poetry and 19 children's books, as well as several pieces of books of prose. Although her poems are short, often with no capitalization or punctuation, they've been likened to proverbs and koans. They invite meditation. I'd like to start with a poem from Clifton's um, high school days where she um, grew up in Depew, New York, which is outside of Buffalo. She was born there in 1937. And this po poem is called This Morning for the Girls of Eastern High School. This morning, this morning, I met myself coming in. A bright jungle girl shining quick as a snake. A tall tree girl, a me girl, I met myself this morning coming in. And all day I have been a black bell ringing, I survive, survive, survive. Here's another one about her childhood. Um, but this one is she wrote as a much um, older woman. And there's a different take on this one too. This one is called Memory. Ask me to tell you how it feels remembering your mother's face turned to water under the white words of the man at the shoe store. Ask me, though she tells it better than I do, not because of her charm, but because it never happened, she says. No bully salesman swaggering, no rage, no shame, none of it ever happened. I only remember you buying your first grown-up shoes, she smiles. Ask me how it feels. Cancer, Clifton wrote a lot about having and being treated for cancer. Um, I'd like to read you one that is from her book called Mercy, and it's titled Cancer. The first time the dreaded word bangs against your eyes so that you think you must have heard it, but you know what you know is that the room is twisting crimson on its hinge, and all the other people there are dolls watching from their dollhouse chairs. The second time you hear a swoosh, as if your heart has fallen down a well and shivers in the water there trying not to drown. The third time, and you are so tired, so tired, and you nod your head and smile and walk away from the angel uniforms, the blood machines, and you enter the nearest movie house and stand in the last aisle, staring at the screen with your living eyes. When I heard Clifton read the next poem, Dialysis, it was in Salt Lake City. And she explained how she really wanted to end the poem with a, um, with a period. She wanted to be very positive. But she read it again and then decided she really wanted to be honest. And so she ended it with a question mark. It's called Dialysis. 
After the cancer, the kidneys can refuse to continue. They closed their thousand eyes. Blood fountains from the blind man's arm and decorates the tile today. Somebody mops it up. The woman who is over 90 cries for her mother. If our dead were here, they would save us. We are not supposed to hate the dialysis unit. We are not supposed to hate the universe. This is not supposed to happen to me. After the cancer, the body refused to lose any more. Even the poisons were claimed and kept until they threatened to destroy the heart they love. In my dream, a house is burning. Someone crawls out of the fire, cleansed and purified. In my dream, I call it light. After the cancer, I was so grateful to be alive. I am alive and furious. Blessed be even this. At a medical conference, a gynecologist uh, told us that she reads this next poem of Clifton's um, before she goes, every time before she goes in to perform a hysterectomy, because she wants her fellow surgeons and especially the trainees to remember what they are removing from a woman's life and her body. The poem's called To My Last Period. Well, girl, goodbye after 38 years. 38 years and you never arrived splendid in your red dress without trouble for me somewhere, somehow. Now it is done and I feel just like the grandmothers who after the hussy has gone, sit holding her photograph and sighing, sighing. Wasn't she beautiful? Wasn't she beautiful? In this next poem, parts of a body also are well, the parts of the body are actually speaking. Um, it's a rather disturbing poem. It's about uh, James Bird, who was dragged behind a pickup in 1998. I think it's a poem that is being shared an awful lot in the past several weeks. It's called Jasper, Texas, 1998, for J. Bird. I am a man's head hunched in the road. I was chosen to speak by the members of my body. The arm as it pulled away pointed toward me. The hand opened once and was gone. Why and why and why should I call a white man brother? Who is the human in this place? The thing that is dragged or the dragger? What does my daughter say? The sun is a blister overhead. If I were alive, I could not bear it. The townsfolk sing, we shall overcome, while hope bleeds slowly from my mouth into the dirt that covers us all. I am done with this dust. I am done. The final poem I'd like to read um, is uh, one that, um, it's called Study the Masters, and uh, it's about one of Clifton's aunts. She writes a lot about her family. Um, and a lot of her poems, although I haven't read some of the very funny ones today, uh, she has a wonderful sense of humor. And she was talking about Aunt Timmy, who is in this poem, as being one of the more beautiful of her aunts. Study the Masters. Like my Aunt Timmy, it was her iron, or one like hers, that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too, words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order, and America. As I said earlier, Clifton's poems have been likened to meditations. So I invite you to think about this last poem of hers. Master poet refers to those writers read and studied in classes on American poetry. Until recently, all white men, mostly dead from the Northeast. 
Yet Clifton reminds us that these men were not only influenced by, but inspired by others they didn't see. Like Aunt Timmy, ironing sheets as she sang to herself in some back room of a hotel. What matters is, writes Clifton, that he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed too, words some Cherokee, some Maasai, and some huge and particular as hope. Who inspires you to dream? Who may not be in your line of sight, yet enables you to imagine things as huge and particular as hope? I invite you to reflect upon that. And as always, to stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you.